covering and protecting us. And thanking God for us. Today is our theme day. The Lord has spoken to our hearts and the vision is set forth for you. We're going to have Mr. McAllister now to set out our flyers, our posters, our sermon outlines. And we do this, uh, so we ask why do you all have an annual theme? We've had an annual theme now for over 10 years. And the reason why we do an annual theme because our annual theme represents a goal. It's a goal, it's an objective, it's a target. And it's something that in February and June and July, amen, when you go through various situations and circumstances, you need something to anchor you. Uh, you need something to go back to. And the annual theme is what we go back to. Last year, our annual theme was standing on God's promises. And so every month I went back to that theme, amen, no matter what the test, no matter what the trial, we were standing on God's promises, amen. So it gives you an anchor, it gives you a foundation. If you don't uh, use goals in your life, if you don't have any goals, if you've never written any goals down, I would strongly encourage you to set some goals in your life, amen. And somebody said, what about a picture? When you set the goals, so it gives you an aim, amen. But if the Bible says, without a vision, the people perish. And what it's talking about there, if you don't have something to aim for, if you don't have a target, if you don't have something that you're aiming for, then you will end up, like the songwriter just said, you end up drifting away. And you end up being anywhere. You end up being lost. And you end up getting entangled in a lot of stuff that doesn't help you get to your goal. But when you have a goal, when you have a theme, amen, sometimes during the year, something's going to knock you off target. You can bring it right over. Please, thank you. Can give it. Something will bring you right over target. But how many know you can stay on target when you got a theme, when you got a goal? Amen. You can say, that's not consistent with my goal. That's not consistent with my theme. But that's not consistent with where the Lord has taken me. And so you don't take part in everything. Uh, when you know where you're headed, then you also know where you're not headed. Amen. Uh, once you know where you're headed, then you know where you're not headed. And in some places they don't agree or, or compliment where you're headed, so you don't take part in that because that's not where you're headed. Uh, you're headed to a different place. If you're headed to California, you don't want to end up in Mississippi. Amen. So the road that takes you to Ohio is different than the road that takes you to Mississippi. And once you know that you're on the wrong road, you get on the right road. Somebody know what I'm saying? But the only way you know you're on the wrong road is you got to start on the right road. Uh, you got to have a map. You got to have a GPS. You got to have a map that says this is the right way. And the Word of God tells us this is the right way. And I said, anything that goes against the Word of God is the wrong way. It's that some of us said, you don't really have to figure it out. It's just a simple math. The Bible is right and somebody is wrong. Amen. So whatever the Bible says is right, somebody says something that the Bible doesn't say they're wrong. No matter how smart they are, no matter how educated they are, no matter how spiritual they are, no matter what language they're talking to you in, amen. if they say something that's not consistent with the Word of God, then they're wrong. Because the Bible is right all the time. All the time and forever will be right until we leave this world. And even when we leave this world, the Bible says, what shall stand, heaven and earth shall what pass away, but my word. His word is going to stand forever. His word. So if you stay on God's word, you, there's no way you're not going to stay forever. Because His word is going to stay forever. So our annual theme this year is, Lord, order my steps in your word. Lord, order my steps in your word. That's our prayer. That's our goal. That's our aim as a corporate body of the New Jerusalem Homeless Safe Church in 2018. Lord, order my steps. We want to be where God wants us to be. Amen. Uh, we want to do the thing God wants us to do. And if God doesn't want us to do it, we don't want to do it. Amen. Uh, uh, Don McClurk is saying the song that said, uh, when I get to heaven, heaven's going to be all right just because you're there. He said people talk about Paul and Peter and all. He said, even if Paul wasn't there, as long as you're there, I'm fine. Amen. So even if somebody don't make it, if you're there, Jesus, then I'm going to be all right. If the Lord is there where you are, then you're all right. It doesn't matter who else is there. Amen. If Jesus is there, that's all you need. All you need is Jesus and his word. The Bible says he is his word. In the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was God. And the word was made flesh and what? To dwell among us. So when you're in the presence of Jesus, when you're with Jesus, you're with his word. Jesus is his word, unlike men and women. So our topic today, Lord, order my steps in your word. And we're going to begin... I believe we're going to begin in the two passage scriptures that many of us are familiar with in Psalms, one being Psalm 37, uh, the other being Psalm 119, and then we're going to go back and read about Gideon 
uh, read a little bit about the parents of Samson, read a little bit about Peter and Cornelius, and then read a little bit about Paul and Ananias. So that's a lot, so we're not going to get to everything, but I'm going to try to make sure we highlight, you know, we may not be able to read all these passages. I will give you the whole scripture text, and then I will highlight the scriptures that are most relevant. But we do want to read uh, our key scriptures here. Psalms 37, verses 22 through 24 reads on this wise. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighted in his way. Now, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Now, what does that mean? It means two things. First of all, it means that the Lord will actually order your steps. So you end up right where God wants you when you're supposed to be there. But it also means if you're a good person, the Lord will order your steps. So if you get on that wrong road to Mississippi, he'll turn you back to L.A. It means both things. It means, first of all, that he will order your steps so you're always in the right place. But him knowing that we're human beings, amen, sometimes you're going to get back on that California road and you were meant to go to Mississippi. And the Bible says, all things work up together for good to them that love the Lord, to them who are part of what I mean. He will order your steps so at some point you're going to get back on that right road. Now, you might be tested and tried while you're on the wrong road. When you're on the wrong road, you might run into bumps you wouldn't run on if you were on the right road. Uh, but how many know eventually you can get back on the right road? And the Lord never closes the right road. Oh, Lord, he never puts up a detour. Today, when I was coming to church today, and they had a detour sign, and uh, car 787 uh, was blocked off. And, and I don't know, Troy, I don't know anything that well. I just drive the main road. I'm a main road person. And so I just, you know, what I did, I said, let the blind lead the blind. And I said, somebody else trying to go where I'm going. I just got by about five cars. Uh, and I got where I was going. But see, I didn't know where I was going. But how many know God will put somebody in your way? <laughs> oh, glory. He'll put somebody in your way who knows what they're going. And he'll tell you, follow that person. And you'll end up in the right place. You don't have to know everything. You just have to know God. <laughs> if you know God, then you have access to everything. You don't have to know everything. But if you know God, you have access to everything uh, that God has. Amen. We think we give honor in our protocol uh, to the board of trustees, unto the evangelists, the board of elders, the ministers, our prayer, the worship team, our musicians, our technology team, our service team uh, today, our deacon and our deaconesses, uh, my wife, Dr. Pamela Harper, and we thank God for her. Uh, she prepared the flyers, and uh, after I do the, 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 the craft work that she does, the expert, expert work. So thank God for that. Amen. And then my children, Brianna and Timothy, are here today. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Uh, the, the Lord will order your steps when you're a good person, when you have the right intent. It, it don't mean uh, that the Lord will uh, put, a, put a star in the sky. See, it just means the Lord will make things happen so they end up working for your good. It don't mean that the Lord will always tell you to go left or right. It just means when you go left, you'll put a blessing in your way. It don't mean always that he's going to make the way plain for you. Sometimes the Lord doesn't make the way plain. Sometimes he makes you pray. Uh, sometimes he makes you fast. Sometimes he makes you wrestle. Sometimes he makes you tussle. But ultimately, if you desire the Lord, uh, ultimately, if you want to touch the hem of his garment, uh, he's going to make his garment available to you. If you, if you want to be in his presence, uh, he's going to make his presence available to you. If you want to see his glory, he's going to make his glory available to you. Oh, Lord, the steps of a good man are ordered uh, by the Lord. Uh, the Lord will make it. He'll set you up. The Lord knows the future. He knows the future. I'll just give you an example. If we were in a, a house that we live in, uh, is way out in the country. Some of you have been there, some of you not, but we live way out in the country. I never imagined myself driving the country roads of any state, let alone New York State. Amen. When, when we were uh, looking at the house, we had already looked at it. Uh, we had been in a, a housing market that my wife was pregnant with Brown. And so we had been in a housing market for months. We had went through two realtors. Amen. They were mad at us because we weren't. We, when, you get, when you know the Lord, you know the Lord. You know so we didn't even let realtors put pressure on us. They were, got mad at us and angry at us. And we kept saying, no, we were uh, talking to a builder and he wasn't bringing the price down. We wasn't bringing the price up. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, so 
uh, we went out to the house, and uh, I, I, I'm not really a house shopper. My wife, she had a little bit. She watched a home and garden TV every once in a while. Uh, so she had a list of things that she wanted in the house, and uh, we went out there way out in the country, and it felt like it took you five hours to get there. It took you, but it took a long time to get there, believe me. It still take a long time, but not as long as it used to. Help me, Holy Ghost. Uh, but, but in going out there, we went out there the first time, and we said, okay, it's got your list. It's got everything that you wanted, more than what she wanted. But it was still a long way out there. We went out there a second time. And then I finally told her, I said, I believe this is the house uh, that the Lord wants us to have. And it wasn't, it wasn't ideal in terms of location. But I told her, I believe it's the ideal. And I'm going to show you how good God is. And so uh, when we, when our kids uh, were young, they went to a, a school. A school is far from our house. Far from our house. Uh, it used to take us 35 minutes to take them. But their last school, the school they're in now, is only 12 minutes from our house. Isn't God good? And so we had no idea where they would be going to school, but the Lord knew where they would be going to school, and he knew that if we're not going to be driving when she go to that school, the shortest drive possible is best. You know what I'm saying? So God knows how to work it out. So way ahead of our thinking, way ahead of our planning, God had a plan. We could not have fathomed that. We could not have written it down. We could have not have uh, conceptualized it, but God said the steps of a good man are ordered uh, by the Lord. He will uh, have you uh, in the right place at the right time when you can't even figure out why you're doing what you're doing. God has a plan. Uh, he says in verse 24, it says, though he fall, uh, he shall not utterly uh, be, be utterly cast down, for the Lord uphold of him uh, with his hand. Now, listen, the Lord is good, and he acknowledges, he says, listen, even though, he, and he's still talking about a good man. He's not talking about a bad person. He says that the good man, sometimes he's going to fall. But he says, even when he falls, he should not be utterly cast down. He's not going to uh, be taken from my arms. He's not going to uh, be taken from my presence. I'm not going uh, to destroy him. I may have to allow him to be tested. I may have to allow him to suffer. I may allow him to go through. But ultimately, that's still my child. You know what I'm saying? See, even when the Lord has to uh, discipline
through that test. Uh, I remember their testimony. Uh, I remember the testimonies on New Year's Eve. Somebody said, well, what well, 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 people testify? Uh, are you not to help them? Yeah, we can help them. Uh, but I believe their testimony is part of their growth uh, and their development. Uh, I believe their testimony uh, is a statement that I'm coming out of this thing. Uh, I believe the state testimony is a, a statement of deliverance. Huh? The testimony is a statement of power. Huh? Listen, you can't declare victory over the enemy huh? until you have put the enemy behind you. Huh? And when you begin to testify huh? that I put the enemy behind me now, huh? then you can talk about what you went through. Huh? But sometimes you have to testify by faith. Huh? But there's a difference between a testimony of faith huh? and a testimony of reality. Huh? And yes, we've got to testify by faith. Huh? But a testimony by faith is just that. Huh? It's myself seeing that I'm coming out. Huh? It's myself seeing that I've been delivered. Huh? But a testimony of deliverance, huh? a testimony of freedom huh? is now Put your 
position uh, to be the top and not the bottom. Uh, he's going to put you in a position uh, to be the borrower and not the lender. Uh, he's going to put you in a position uh, to be the head uh, and not the tail. Uh, but once he positions you, uh, you've got to live right. Uh, you've got to talk right. Uh, you've got to sing right. Uh, you've got to praise right. Uh, if you do the right thing, Up. Sometimes we mess up God's blessings. Huh? He gives us and puts us in situations huh? that we ought not have been in anyhow. Y'all know what I'm saying? Huh? It's like when somebody uh, give you a reference for a job uh, and you shouldn't have had the job, uh, but they give you a job because your reference recommended you. Huh? And then you go in there and mess it up. Uh, mess it up the job. Mess it up your reference. Mess it up the other person's name. Uh, the Lord don't want his name to be messed up. You know what I'm saying? If you're going to mess up, he'd rather have if you're going to mess up, you say, Lord, don't put me there yet. But when the Lord puts you there, you want to say, Lord, I'm ready to fight the good fight of faith. I'm ready to give you praise. I'm ready to walk in this thing. I'm ready to talk in this thing. I'm ready, Lord. My armor is on. So we go to these stories quickly, the story of Gideon. And again, I don't have time for those of you that have been sitting your outline, but you want to read uh, Judges 6. Uh, 25 through 27. Huh? But I just want to take a clause in the scripture. The Bible says in verse 26, huh? and they built an order unto the Lord thy God at the top of the rock. Huh? And then the clause I want to talk about for a moment huh? with respect to Gideon. Huh? The Bible said it was in the ordered place. Huh? Now what does that mean, the ordered place? Huh? The ordered place is where God had established huh? that altar to be huh? Even before Gideon got there. Huh? So you've got to understand the spiritual revelation huh? of an order place. Huh? Order place does not mean huh? cake and ice cream. Huh? Order place does not mean always triumph and victory. Huh? Order place just means that's where God has you at that time huh? in that season. Huh? Order place for Jesus Christ huh? was Calvary. Huh? Y'all know what I'm saying? Huh? Somebody said there's a was his order place. Huh? Somebody said, what about the stripes? Huh? His stripes were ordered by God. Huh? What about the piercing his side? Huh? The piercing his side was ordered by God. Huh? What about the crown of thorns upon his head? Huh? It was ordered by God. Huh? So just because you go to an order place, huh, it doesn't mean you're going to be shouting. Huh? Just because you go to an order place, huh, it doesn't mean you're always going to be up but you still can praise uh, even in the pain. Uh, I taught a broadcast a while back that said, you've got to learn how to sing uh, in the rain. Uh, you've got to learn how to praise uh, when you're going through. Uh, I believe that when Jesus was on the cross, uh, he did not complain. Uh, he was getting hit and getting nailed. Uh, but the Bible said they would not let them break his bones uh, because he was in an order place. Uh, now what are you saying, preacher? Uh, I'm trying say huh, that when you're in an order place, huh, it's happening to you. Huh, it's what God will allow to happen to you. Huh. So even though Jesus Christ huh, was on the cross huh, and man thought he had all power over Jesus, huh, they couldn't break his bone. Glory. Huh, they could only do what God allowed him to do. Huh. When you get to your order place, huh, the enemy might be able to smack you. Huh. The enemy might be able to do something to you. Huh, but they can only do But you know you're there because God has 
said, Lord, how shall I order it? Huh? What shall I do with it? Huh? How shall I command it? Huh? How shall I manage it? Huh? And then when you give it to God, huh, it will want to pop. When you give it to God, it will want to pop. Huh? Y'all remember the story huh, about the fishes huh, and the five loaves. Huh? On one case, he fed 4,000 men and others. Huh? On another case, he fed 5,000 and others. Huh? But let me show you the revelation. Huh? The revelation it did not multiply huh, until it got in the hands of Jesus. Huh? Y'all know what I'm saying? Huh? It's not going to multiply in my hands. Huh? It's not going to multiply in your hands. Huh? But if you give it to Jesus, huh? if you give it back to the Lord, Now let's then go to the story of Peter and Kanish. I don't have time. Here you've got to read all act of Acts 10 and Acts 11. Acts 10 and Acts 11. But let me just focus on a couple verses here. A couple elements of this scripture. Uh, the Bible uh, says in Acts 10 and 4, And when he looked on him, he was afraid uh, and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers uh, and thine arms are come up uh, for a memorial before God. Uh, now remember what we talked about. Uh, the strength of a what man? He didn't say the steps of men uh, are ordered by God. Let's not tell that lie. The Lord didn't say the steps of people are ordered by the Lord. He said the steps of a good man uh, are ordered by the Lord. Uh, so the Lord wants to know here that Cornelius was a good man. Uh, he was praying. Uh, he was seeking God's face. Uh, and so that's what you got to do. Uh, you got to yourself in a position huh, where God can order your steps. Huh? You've got to stay out of mess huh, and stay out of trouble huh, so God can order your steps. Huh? you got to stay out of anything that will defile you. Huh? In the Old Testament, they use the word defile. Huh? Now, what does defile mean? Huh? We call it contamination. Huh? Contamination huh, is anything that comes upon you huh, and contaminates the surface. Huh? Up in global foundries in Malta, huh, they have what they call clean rooms huh? because they build these little chips huh? and not one speck of dust huh? can go on the chips. Huh? So in order to go into the clean room, huh, you've got to put on a suit huh? that will not contaminate the clean room. Huh? In other words, you're contaminated, but you got to put on a suit huh? that will not contaminate huh? the clean room. Huh? What is the Lord trying to say? Huh? Once he cleans you up, huh? Become a clean room. Oh, for now you're a new creature in Christ. Huh? Now you've got some anointing. Huh? Now you've got some power. Huh? Now you've got a gift. Huh? You can't afford to go back to the contamination. Huh? Put your suit on. Huh? Put your armor on. Huh? Put holiness on. Huh? Put righteousness on. Huh? Put the faith on. Huh? And say, I refuse huh, to be defiled. Huh? I'm going to see the king. Divide. Right? We gotta be refused the vomit. The same energy that we have to go to parties, that's where you gotta fight the power. It's about the thing in life that motivates you most. That's the same motivation you gotta bring. I'm not gonna let anything defile me. See, it's better to err on the side of not being divided. You know what I'm saying? Well, I'm not sure then don't go. <laughs> I'm not sure then don't do it. See, it's better to err on the side of just not doing it. Because right? it's not life or death anyhow. And right? not somebody say, oh, I missed the party. It wasn't life or death. You still alive? If you weren't alive, you would know you missed the party. Right? If there's a chance, it's going to defile you. If there's a chance, it's going to mess you up. Why go? Why partake? You're in a clean room now. See, up in Global Brown, if they let that clean room get dirty, they lose a million dollars an hour. So if they can't afford that, they kill you before they let you go in there dirty. You know what I'm saying? Because for them, that's their money, that's their profit. If you 
walking around, they'll shoot you. That's the same way you ought to be about yourself. I'll shoot you before I let myself be defined. That's why the Bible says, pluck your right hand off. Pluck your left Do what you got to do, but don't let yourself be defiled. Your anointing is at stake. Your power is at stake. Your deliverance is at stake. So you got to err on the side of not being defiled. So because Cornelius was a good man, and he sought the Lord, the Lord had to find somebody else. I told you the Lord will work for you while you're working for him. And so while Cornelius was working for the Lord, the Lord was working on Peter. He said, Peter, I want you to know I got somebody coming to you. And they're a little bit different, Peter. Y'all know how this when folks are a little bit different, we respond differently to them. And so Cornelius was a Gentile. The Jews had nothing to do with the Gentiles. Not only did the Jews have nothing to do with the Gentiles, but when the other Jews found out that a Jew had something to do with the Gentiles, So there was social pressure that Peter faced. Now, so the Lord said, I've got, I, I see Cornelius praying, I, but I've got to go work on Peter. I, and so what he did, I don't have time to really break it down. I, but he shows Peter a vision I, of all kinds of different things to eat. I, because Peter thinks, I'm really, really good at two shoes, I, and I only eat certain things. I, but the Lord had to show him, I, it's a time for a new diet. I, it's time for a new witness. I, and so he he takes and shows them that if I call something clean, you can't call it unclean, Peter. He said, if I call the Gentiles clean, you can't call them unclean. Now, I gave you this vision. Now, I have a Gentile who is praying. I have a Gentile who is fasting. Now, they don't have the Holy Ghost. They don't have the Holy Ghost yet. They haven't been baptized yet, but they're praying. That's what I like about the Bible. That's why I read my Bible, and I don't go to my man's tradition. If you read your Bible carefully, in the Bible when people were praying, that was sufficient for God, for them to get some help. Because he didn't say they had to be baptized yet. He said, as long as they're seeking me, I'm going to send them some help. And so Cornelius was praying. He did not have the Holy Ghost. He did not yet been baptized in Jesus' name. But the Lord saw his cry. The Lord heard his voice. And so I'm going to send somebody who got some knowledge. I'm going to send somebody who got some expertise. Because the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And so Cornelius sends a troop of men to go get Peter. Peter comes back to Cornelius. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Now what happens? Not only does Cornelius get saved, but his whole family, his whole household gets saved. Why did they get saved? Because he was praying. Because he was seeking God. When you want your step ordered by the Lord, pray. When you want your step by the Lord, seek God. you don't pray. He was praying. So the Lord ordered his steps. He was a good man, so the Lord ordered his steps. This didn't happen by accident. Blessings don't happen by accident. Good things don't. The Bible says all good things come from where? They come from above. Blessings don't happen by accident. Somebody's praying. Now, I don't want you to understand. I'm not saying that the only way you get blessings is to pray. But praying helps get blessing. If I feel like God is not blessing me and I'm not praying, Lord, let me take that one off. You know what I'm saying? If you feel like you're under blessed, go back and say, am I doing everything I should be doing? If I feel like God doesn't love me, go back first of all and say, have I done everything? Yes, the church has to help people, but you got to help yourself. The first way we help ourselves is look in this Bible and say, Lord, is there something I'm not doing? Once 
folks who aren't living holy. So they're not getting exactly what they deserve. You can stand in the gap for them. Right, but you understand it. Love I said, the way to sin is. So we just have to understand that the church's job is to stand in the gap. Stand in the gap. Stand in the gap. Pray, pray, pray. And all this time people say, why don't you pray a lot for all this stuff going on in the world? Because the Bible says in the last day, perilous times will come. Why should I be praying for stuff the Bible already says is going to happen? But why can you pray? How can you stop war when the Lord says we're going to have war? But I don't pray for no war. The Lord said we're going to have war. There's a rumor of the war. So I'm not praying for something the Bible already says we're going to have it. But you pray for the Lord, you still be in charge. If we bomb North Korea, you take over, Lord. Because that's all we can do. There's no guarantee we're not going to bomb North Korea. There's no guarantee we're not going to be in a war with Israel next month. But the guarantee is that God is sovereign. Y'all you know what I'm saying? So whether we're at war or not, they got an option. How many nuclear weapons they got? If God wants to get hit, we'll get hit. If we don't want us to get hit, we're not going to get hit. But so there's just a plan against stuff that the Bible already says. You can't pray against stuff the Bible already says. But you can ask the Lord to repent. Read the Bible. The Bible says they're repenting God. So he does change his mind. In the middle of the situation, in the middle of the circumstance, God will change his mind. Right? Hezekiah, you got 15 years. Oh, Lord. You know what? I've been praising. I've been worshiping. I've been magnified. Go tell me God longer. You know what I'm saying? You can talk back to God and say, Lord, I've been praising you. I've been worshiping you. I've been living for you. I've been witnessing for you. And you can turn to the Lord and say, you got more time. You can change God's mind. You can change God's mind. The last story here. Amen. Remember the steps. Order. The first thing God does, God does the order. We don't order. But we have to have an ear to hear what the Spirit said in order to hear an office or appointment. But it's an order. God does the order. You just believe. When you walk by the Spirit, your steps are ordered by God. Right? When you walk in the Spirit, your steps are being ordered by God. And then comes the office and the appointment. That is when God assigns you based on the talents, the level of faith, the things he's given you, assigns you to an office or to an appointment. After he gives you that appointment, then he calls for obedience. He calls for obedience. Now, Cornelius, if you notice here, what happens when somebody said, I'm an outsider. It don't matter whether you're an outsider. Cornelius was an outsider, but because he obeyed God, he became an insider. You know what I'm saying? See, that's why God don't pay no attention to status. Somebody said, I'm broke. It don't matter how much money you got. Not over here in Zion. It don't matter how big your house is. Not over here in Zion. It don't matter what kind of car you drive over here in Zion. God takes outsiders and makes them insiders. Just ask Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. He became a disciple. Just ask they became disciples. God takes outsiders. Just ask Ruth. She was an old a Moabitess. She wasn't a Jew. God said, come on, Ruth. You're an insider. God can take outsiders and make you an insider. And as long as you have the Lord on your side, you're an insider anyhow. No matter how you feel. Last story. Saul and Ananias. We've talked about this story quite a bit. By the way, I think I said it. Cornelius was baptized in Jesus' name, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. But what led it to, what led us up here, brother? He prayed. He started off by praying. He wasn't saved, but he prayed. Pray, pray, pray. Saul's conversion to Paul. My last story here. Saul was doing what he thought was right. See, that's what a lot of people don't understand. When Paul was persecuting the church, that's what he was taught to do. Paul was doing what he thought was right. It was wrong, but he was doing what he thought was right. And notice what he did. What, what Saul they said, everything I do, I'm going to do it with my all. He didn't play around. So the Bible says that he did. The Bible doesn't tell us that Paul killed anyone. It says he consented unto their death. In other words, Paul was managing the people who were doing the killing. And he did it well. He, he, he had a reputation. So the disciples.
world and the people who were living right were afraid of Paul. But God wanted to take the same energy, the same commitment. See, commitment, people who are committed at one thing will be committed to another. People who can't be committed to anything can't be committed to anything. Let's take it. It's hard for people who are committed to something not to be committed to everything they do. But people who have a low level of commitment, it's hard for them to commit to anything. It's hard. Somebody said, I, I, I'll give you a perfect example. That we, where I teach, sometimes students get in trouble and they sit on what they call unsat, unsatisfactory notices. Now, almost every time one, a student gets one unsat nominee they get, they get one for every class. You know what? They're not committed to one class, they're not going to commit to any class. <laughs> Once you try to have trouble in one class, you have trouble in all your classes, right? But the students who do well in all their classes, they tend to do well. You might say, I'm not talking about getting A, I'm not talking about showing up doing your work, right? That's good enough for some folks. Some folks just want to get out of there. Right? They just want to roll out and out and I don't blame them, right? But the idea is, the general, we have problems in our life, it's not just in one area, right? Now, what, the people at work only see me at work. The people at church only see me at church. The people at home only see me at home. So they may be thinking, man, what how Mr. Harper have all the problems there, but the skip were asking the same thing. Pamela Harper asking the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but when folks have a problem, they have a problem everywhere. You just only see one piece of it. That's why you gotta pray for people. Right? Because if you're seeing problems, they're having problems elsewhere as well. So Saul was really, really good at what he did. So God said, let me take that energy, let me take that commitment, let me take that passion and turn it over to good, right? The steps of a good man are what? Or about Saul was a good man, he was just doing the wrong thing. There are some people out there, they're good, there's some drug dealers, they're the smartest people in the world. That's how they built their mansion, right? There's some people out there doing some bad stuff. There are some good people out there who are doing some bad stuff because they got socialized into the bad stuff, right? That's all they know. That's all they got trained into, right? The Bible says, train up a child in what? And one what? Okay. what is that? What's the opposite of that? When you train up a child to be bad, what are they going to like to be? Unless God get a hold of them, right? So a lot of children, the reason why they're bad is because they were trained to be bad. And that's all they know, but they're real good at being bad. So Saul was real good at being bad, but then God said, listen, I'm going to take what you're good at, and I'm going to make you for me. So the Lord had to get a hold of him, so he put him on a roll, right? And you all know the story that he was knocked off of his animal, right? And the Lord blinded him. Now, here's the one thing, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, right? Saul had to follow folks who hated him, and he couldn't see he had to follow folks who he know hated him, and he couldn't see it. Wow. Ananias had to go to a man who hated him, and he could see it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Saul had to follow folks who hated him, and he couldn't see. Ananias had to go see a man he could see, but he thought the man hated him. He thought the man hated him based on what he had heard. Right? Isn't that a situation? Yep. The steps of a good man are what? Ordered by, the Ordered by the Lord. So the Lord said, I'm going to take Ananias, who's a good man. I'm going to take Saul, who's a good man. And I'm going to put those two good men together, and we're going to get something out of this. You know what I'm saying? The Lord will take good folks. When you've got the right mind, the Lord will find you with somebody else with a good mind. He said, let's get something out of this. And so he said, let's take Ananias and get that fear out of him, for I have not given you the spirit of but a power, love, and a sound mind. He said, first of all, I've got to get the fear out of you. And so now, how did God get the fear out of him? He told him, listen, I have a man, and I know he used to be bad, but now I've got something for him to do. And you're going to be all right, Ananias. Go on over there. Now, somebody said, what is that akin to? That's akin to if you heard somebody was going to shoot you, and God sent you to witness to them. You heard a rumor somebody wanted to shoot you, and then God told you, go witness. That way, I'm out of Facebook. Right? We can take this stuff for granted. That's nothing to take for granted. He had a thought for a man, and all he knew about a man, there are times a man senior, he tell the person to kill him. He tell the law people to kill him. 
said, well, Ananias do. But God said, I've got a work for him to do. And the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So Ananias went, and when Saul, who could not see until it was time for him to what? To see. See, sometimes you can't see until it's time for you to see. But if I can't see it. doesn't mean your steps aren't being ordered. <laughs> glory! You might not be able to see the way, but it doesn't mean that your steps aren't being ordered. Uh, oh, glory! He couldn't see, but his steps were being ordered by God. Sometimes the Lord has to blind us in order to get us to go the right way. Uh, you have to close your eyes to that external. You have to close your eyes to the situation. You have to close your eyes to the circumstance to show you that I'm God. And as long as you follow me, you're going to end up in the right place. So he blind saw him just into the right place. And then when it's time for him to get saved, he opens his eyes. Right. And Ananias witnesses to Saul. Baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm saying? The steps of a good man are what order by the Lord. All these stories show things that God doesn't work by accident. God doesn't work by accident. The steps of God's people are ordered by God. He'll put you right where he needs you when he needs you there. You've got to be in the ordered place. When you get to the ordered place, don't let the devil run you away. Don't let the devil mess with you. That's your ordered place. Get in quickly afford to move from the order place. If the order place wasn't the best, you would have ordered something different, but that's what God ordered. You know what I'm saying? The order place might not be what you order, but it's what God ordered. <laughs> See, a lot of us, we want to order our own stuff. You can order your own stuff, but it won't be as good as God got for you. It might be name brand, but it's not going to last. You know what I'm saying? Oh, glory. You can get the best, or even have what God has. I'll take what God has rather than the best. Of course, how many you find the best. Lord, order my steps in your word. If you have to close my eyes for a while, like you did saw just to get me there, or close my eyes. Don't let me see all the mess. Because sometimes you have to walk through mess to get to your bless. <laughs> I didn't say become part of the mess, but you have to walk through it. Sometimes you have to walk through stuff in order to get where God got you to go. Your rock sometimes is on the other side of the mess. You know what I'm saying? Your rock is sometimes on the other side of the mess. God just repeats that way. He says, Lord, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I know what fear of you. No, what do not write? I said, they what they come from. That's what they come from. Shake and fresh and tell me all the day. So our theme this year is Lord. Order my steps in your will. Not what I want, Lord. Not my will, but thy will. Not my way, but thy way. Not my thoughts, but your thoughts. That's what we got to do. That's aspiration. We call it aspiration. It don't mean we're there on January 7th, whatever today is. But it means that December, I'm going to be closer than I was now. You know what I'm saying? The Lord allowed me to live. I'm going to be closer then than I am right now. Because I'm going to keep aiming for the church. Now you can buy into it whether you want to or not, but that's the church's goal. That's my personal goal. Lord, order my steps in your world. 